This episode of Coffee Talks is brought to you by Markham LLP Accountants and Advisors. Hi folks, welcome to another episode of Coffee Talk with me. Today I have uh, Brendan Wallace, no relation to William Wallace. I don't think... Uh, I don't think so either. Okay. <laughs> uh, Brendan uh, runs the largest VC fund for uh, PropTech by a multiple of six from what I understand. And today we're going to talk to him about climate tech, prop tech, where it is, where it's going, and so on. Uh, Brendan, welcome. My first question is, um, why is it that everything regarding climate tech uh, and being green, why is it so boring? Why is it that people are just, you know, we, we do a lot of stories on this stuff, and they always rank at the bottom of the list in terms of traffic? Uh, it's good. I haven't thought about why it's so boring from a press perspective, although I think part of it is that people don't like reading bad news and the imperative to decarbonize is kind of bad news for real estate. I'm going to disagree with you right there. People love reading bad news. I mean, so I mean not when it's about them. Right. And I think that's maybe is what's different here. So the real estate industry, it's estimated that to achieve true carbon zero needs to invest around $18 trillion. So to put that in perspective, US GDP is like 20 some odd trillion dollars. Mm. We know that we're going to have to do that over the next roughly 20 years. So one year of GDP over the next 20 is just going to go into retrofitting the existing U.S. commercial building stock. And how fast do you think something like that would be? I mean, I feel like there would be a lot of resistance to something like that. You know, talcum powder, uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson knew talcum powder caused cancer 50 years ago. And the government knew about it. And still they allowed you know, that stuff to exist and be produced and be bought and sold for years up until 2020, literally, right? So from 1967 to 2020, they allowed this stuff to be out there. And you know, the lobbying uh, group is so strong for, you know, if you're talking about doing $18 trillion in retrofitting, I feel like you can get a huge amount of resistance from the industry and the people who support it. Yeah, I mean, there definitely is some resistance. I think the bulk of the resistance is from the real estate industry itself because it has historically underinvested so much in retrofitting its assets. But what's different, I think, more recently is that the real estate industry kind of sits triangulated between three forces that are compelling it to decarbonize, and not all of them are obvious. The first is capital markets, right? So the largest capital allocators on Earth, the, the Black Rocks of the world, are saying, we will preferentially deploy capital to low or no carbon footprint real estate. This is debt, this is equity, this is insurance premiums, and real estate is nothing if not a cost of capital driven business. Mm -hmm. This is already happening. So you can see this in how REITs report on their ESG standards and their efforts to decarbonize and convert to renewable energy. So it's definitely driving behavior on the capital market side. The second is tenants themselves. So if you look at some of the largest tenants, tenants like Amazon or Netflix or Google, they're saying we're only going to lease space from landlords that adhere to certain sustainability criteria that we, def we determine. Mm -hmm. If you can't lease space to Amazon, that's a huge deal. But, you know, we were just talking about this earlier that, you know, 90 percent of the leases that happen are under 20,000 square feet. So still a meet of the tenants are still going to want the best deals and not necessarily pay for you know uh, the efficiencies that a green uh, commercial building can offer 90 percent of the leases but i don't know how much of the revenue mm -hmm. and i think that actually matters as well because while there's a, you know a handful of smaller granular leases that are constantly being signed the big tenants drive markets right that's certainly true in california that that is true here as well so if you can't lease space to tenants that have really stringent sustainability criteria that's a big deal for landlords so that's kind of the the private markets driving it the last is local regulators. Like when you think about kind of the, you know, the, the climate drama, so to speak, the least sympathetic characters are real estate owners that don't want to retrofit. Nobody cares about them. That's not the same thing as shutting down a coal plant, right? right. So the need to invest CapEx to decarbonize your asset is something that if a real estate owner doesn't do, they're likely going to be paying carbon fines mm -hmm. and carbon taxes based on these new carbon neutrality laws. Like local law 97 here in New York, there's mm -hmm. Laws contemplated on a number of dockets all throughout the country. So what's interesting is that you're right. Like the real estate industry, I think unsurprisingly, doesn't necessarily want to deal with this problem, but it's just too many forces that have converged on it that are impelling it to decarbonize it. It kind of has to. And the numbers are, are staggering in terms of what the real estate industry has done historically. So we did an analysis to look at the whole real estate industry. If you look at the amount of capital it's put into climate tech over the last 10 years, the total is $96 million. That's less than 
some New York City parking garages, right? <laughs> that's a, it's a shockingly small number. Yeah. And when you learn the number that is needed to decarbonize is $18 trillion, there's a lot of daylight there. And I think that's what the real estate industry is grappling with is like all of that 18 trillion is would be profit. How do you, how do you force something like that or encourage an entire industry to push these kinds of changes? I mean, I've heard education and I've heard policy, but you know, I feel like education is too slow, right? And uh, policy, usually government gets involved when things get really desperate, or, you know, but other than that, how do you, how can you encourage people to take, you know, adopt these kinds of changes? It's hard. It's, it's a great question because it's very, very hard for the real estate industry to do this. And part of it, the reason is the same reason it's hard for the real estate industry to do prop tech, which is you have all this capital flowing into technology. You need hundreds of millions of dollars to be relevant. The ability of any one real estate owner to invest in these new technologies is very small. Mm -hmm. And so they're very unlikely to see the best technologies. So it's actually why, to some extent, what we learned in PropTech in building our first funds informed how we built our climate fund, which is we said, why don't we pull the whole industry together? So we'll get the largest, most sustainability forward real estate owners, have them contribute capital into a single fund that individually their commitments are quite small, but in aggregate is quite large. We just announced a half billion dollar climate fund mm -hmm. that's much larger than any real estate owner could deploy on their own. And your, the entire size of the fund is about 3.2 billion. The entire size of all Fifth Walls funds is 3.2 billion. Mm -hmm. Our climate fund is half a billion dollars that we've announced. And I think that number is, is gonna grow substantially. And one of the reasons is that real estate owners need a solution to mm -hmm. get access to the best decarbonizing technologies for their, their buildings. That could be building management systems, that could be smart building technology, materials tech, that can be you know, on-premise batteries, microgrids, EV charging. The capacity of any one real estate owner to get access to all of those solutions is very small and very limited. And so kind of what we've engineered is like a, a cooperative where all of these real estate owners can come together. We can kind of be the tip of the spear on identifying these solutions and expose them to real estate owners who actually do want to adopt this tech. I think the easiest way to get people to adopt it is to actually make green tech uh, or you know this, the new technology that's there to make things easier and more efficient is to make it more affordable. I mean, why is it that green tech has to be more expensive? Why is it that anything that I want to pay for that has an efficiency tag on it is you know twice as more expensive than something that doesn't have the efficiency tag on it? Wouldn't it make, I mean, that's the easiest way to adopt it. If you just go to people and say, forget your senses and your, you know, your uh, morality and everything else, you're just gonna save money by using this stuff that's more efficient, that's greener, that's uh, gonna make you operate better. That's, that's exactly right. Like we've actually seen that in our portfolio. The companies that are, I would say, most rapidly adopted are those that just have immediate ener energy savings. So we invest in this company, Turntide, which makes motors that power HVAC systems that mm -hmm. save about 30% of the electrical cost to power the same HVAC system, moving the same amount of hot or cold air throughout a building. It's very rapidly being adopted by real estate owners across our consortium because the payback period is just so fast. It's just simply better. I think what's interesting though is there's some technologies that are not yet commercially viable, but there's other drivers that change the economics. So in particular, these carbon neutrality laws and carbon fines that real estate owners are confronting they're kind of looking at, well, the cost of that carbon neutrality fine might be so high that I'm better off just retrofitting and paying for that more expensive system today mm -hmm. that can save me energy. Or it could be, I can't lease to Google if I don't make a particular investment because they're just not gonna lease from an energy inefficient building. So there's this indifference point between the capex, right, that needs to be deployed, which is oftentimes, as you said, more expensive, but there's other considerations because I mean, the real estate industry is staring down this gauntlet of $18 trillion of mm -hmm. deferred capex. And that's partially because it has this outsized contribution to climate change. Real estate is 40% of all CO2 emissions. Mm -hmm. So most, most of the time when people think of like, who are the industries that are kind of at the center of the spotlight around you know, the climate change debate, they think of transportation and heavy manufacturing and agriculture. Real estate is bigger than all of them. It's the largest asset class in the world, and also everything is real estate. Right? Everything so, happens so inside it makes real estate. Sense, yeah. uh, that it would have such an impact on it. But uh, you know, it's funny. You were just talking about this engine and the HVAC system, and you know, our H we have problems with HVAC all the time. But like you, you guys have a hundred or so LPs in your fund. 
how do you become an expert on some of this stuff? I mean, people can, there's a lot of great pitchmen out there who can come and tell you, hey, this is going to be the next great thing. We're in media. People are constantly coming to us and saying, this is going to change, revolutionize everything. But either they can't deliver on it, the tech is not there for it, or people just are not ready to adopt it. But how do you become an expert on, on all these different various, uh, you know, uh, you know, companies and technology that's out there and you say this is the right person for us to back and these are the right companies for us to invest in? It's a great question. And the short answer is venture capital is really hard. And I think a lot of people have learned that the hard way, certainly as the cycle has turned in like the last year. So a lot of kind of recreational, amateur, kind of dabbling venture capitalists, frankly, a lot of the real estate owners themselves that thought they could do this on their own, they learned that it's actually really hard to predict winners in this mm -hmm. space, that venture capital is quite different than real estate. And you're and we right. We saw a lot of that. We saw a lot of companies with a lot of cash flow who were like, we're going to start a $200 million prop tech fund right. because they thought they could adopt it and implement it into their own buildings. But not all of them panned out, right? Obviously. Well, what they were right about is that, yeah, there's a lot of technology they could adopt into their buildings. What they were probably wrong about is that they probably invested in the wrong businesses to adopt in their buildings. And that's the challenge with, with tech and real estate, which is if you think about two industries, right, two asset classes, there's almost no two asset classes that are further apart than real estate and venture capital. Mm -hmm. In real estate, you have cash flow producing, financed with equity and debt, very low intellectual property, like not a lot of operational leverage. It's a very, it's like physically You're going to piss off a lot bond. of our uh, viewers. I know, <laughs> but, it, but, but it's simple, right? It, it's, not, it's not nearly as complex as operating a technology business because there's enormous amounts of operational leverage, huge amounts of intellectual property finance with equi pretty much entirely equity, and it's cash flow negative. And you lose money a lot of the time, mm -hmm. way more than real estate. So it's unsurprising that real estate owners would not make great venture capitalists in the same way that it would be surprising if venture capitalists made great real estate investors. Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of owners have learned that the hard way. And I think the answer to your question of like, how do you identify the right solutions is that you just identify great investors, right? Who have experience, who have reps, who can identify businesses that have the right syndicate of you know, VC backers, that have the right product market fit, that can truly build for the long term. And I think that is, a hard lesson that a lot of kind of startup venture capital funds learned in this last cycle, which is venture capital is not easy. Mm -hmm. Identifying winners, even in a space as obvious as prop tech, where you're talking about an industry that has never adopted tech, really slept, like kind of the real estate industry slept through the entire internet and all of mobile and sometime around 2015, 2016, you'd probably know better than yeah. I do because you started probably writing about it more then, right? right? it woke up in like 2016 and said, we have to adopt tech. It's such an obvious opportunity. And yet so much money was lost. A lot of the tech was not ready. Exactly. Like, so it a wasn't lot of, viable. A lot of people were excited because you had these pitchmen go to these landlords and say, hey, if you put this thing in your floor, this is going to happen. And then, you know, they, they adopt this very expensive technology. They retrofit their buildings based on what somebody told them. And then the Wi-Fi goes out and their $20 million tech that they implemented into the building is it's not functionally working. obsolescent. Right. Yeah. So it's uh, so a lot of people are sort of taken aback and waiting. They have this wait and see attitude with a lot of the prop tech companies that are out there because they want to see that they can last. They want to see that they can get traction and they want to see that these guys are actual operators because having great tech is just not enough, right? You have to be able to operate a business as well so that you can last and be able to produce the product that you're putting out there. I think real estate owners are very good at knowing their own pain points. Meaning if you talk to most real estate owners, they know acutely where the, the, the opportunities for tech are in their business. We could do this better with technology. We should have a software solution for this. They understand that better than anyone. What they're not the best at is mapping that onto the tech companies that are being formed to solve those pain points. Mm -hmm. Which ones are going to succeed? Which ones are going to fail? Who's capitalized those companies? How strong are those entrepreneurs? How do they integrate with existing infrastructure technology? That's quite complicated. That's why venture capital is hard. And so I think that the challenge and the opportunity, and I think actually what has made Fifth Wall very successful is that we kind of marry those two things. We have 110 strategic LPs in our network that we engage with and we say, what are your pain points? What are your challenges? What are you looking for a solution to, right? All of the tech we, we invest in is informed by that. But then we look at the tech ecosystem and we say, what are the companies that are solving these pain points? And oftentimes you encounter 20 different companies that have very similar solutions and we'll like run an RFP 
and we'll try to identify who we think is the best. Whereas oftentimes an individual real estate owner is only seeing one or two of those companies. Mm -hmm. So of course, they're very unlikely to pick the emergent winner. That's just a dynamic. I think that's true in really all of corporate venture capital, but is probably especially true in real estate corporate venture capital. And do you invest with founders or investors? So what do you mean? So do you go and you, you said that you, 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 you put money with investors that have, have a track record and they know, you know, they know their field really well. Uh, so those are obviously investors. They're not founders of companies, you know, like Brimstone, right? So, uh, you know, you guys invest in Brimstone, which is supposed to be... Um, it's carbon negative concrete. Right, carbon negative concrete, which is pretty interesting. I met the founder. He's a pretty interesting guy. But so do you guys... Uh, does that guy come to you? Do you guys go to him? Like, how does that work? So we invest directly in the tech companies themselves. Right. Now, what we, one of the things we look for is who else has invested. In oh, that that's, that's what you meant. So right? that's what I meant. It's more the investor syndicate because in venture capital, of course, these companies are raising money through multiple rounds. And so you can get a real feel for the business based on who else is invested right. and whether they're continuing to invest. So do you guys ever go in first? Yeah, we will go in first. I mean, I'd say we're more likely to go in almost at like Series B, Series Series B, Series C, sometimes Series D. I almost think of that as like corporate adolescence. So you have you know some product market fit, you have some reference customers, but you haven't achieved huge scale. And mm -hmm. so really, you're you know putting operating capital into the business to help it scale. We don't typically do like first money in like pre-product. Mm -hmm. We have done it, but it's rare for us. And I would say we're less likely to do super, super late stage where, you know, really you're just making a kind of uh, IPO timing bet. We're kind of more in the, the corporate adolescent stage, the kind of mid stages of building a company because that's where our 110 strategic LPs and all those distribution lanes are so valuable to the entrepreneur. We need the entrepreneur to be able to capitalize on that. Yeah. You guys went into the SPAC business with a lot of other people. It didn't pan out for a lot of people. It didn't pan out for you guys either. Do you think that was a timing issue or do you think the SPAC, the whole vehicle is a mistake? No, I don't think this, this back vehicle itself is a mistake. We completed our first SPAC. So yeah. we actually merged our first SPAC with one of our portfolio companies. And how's that doing? Uh, IPO last year. We can't comment on the stock performance. Mm -hmm. um, like many tech companies, the performance is obviously down. The whole software market is down. Um, but that company, we're still very confident in. And mm -hmm. that business was one where you had the whole real estate industry validating it, saying, this is the solution we want for the multifamily sector. And that continues to be the case. Um, SPACs, I think, you know, obviously had a lot of excitement around them. And I think there's always going to be a place for them where a company needs a particular sponsor to tell its story or to help tell its story to the market. And I think you know, our SPAC was a good example of that. But not every company needs to go public through a SPAC. Well, you said a lot of them just lost a tremendous amount of value. I mean, even really good companies that went into SPACs, they lost a lot of good value, which was a shame because, you know, they could have done better as a standalone and not, you know, if they hadn't gone public. Yeah, there's a case to be made, I think, for doing IPOs regular way, right? And I think that's probably what got a little out of balance is that there was probably too much of a rotation towards SPAC as the instrumentation to go public mm -hmm. away from kind of traditional IPOs. And to some extent, we've now rotated very far back in the other direction. But the reality is it's an instrument that's been around for a long time. I think there'll always be a place for it. I think there's a place for it in prop tech. I think there's a place for it in software. And there's a place for it in non-tech businesses. Um, <laughs> but it just kind of, you know, it was obviously quite shocking for a lot of capital markets investors to see the cycle turn so dramatically. Uh, you mentioned that you think that a lot of the real estate players are not sophisticated on, you know, prop tech and uh, climate tech and all that. Well, stuff. sorry, uh, let me just clarify that point. They're actually very sophisticated on tech and they have fantastic teams internally around adopting tech. What they're a little less sophisticated on is the investment into tech businesses, the venture capital side of it they struggle with. Right. But actually integrating tech, they're quite good at that. And I think that's kind of being self-aware for a real estate owner around where your strengths lie and where your challenges are. Real estate owners know their business better than anyone else, better than the entrepreneurs that are building solutions for them. Mm -hmm. They truly know their business. What they're just not the best at is identifying which of all the tech companies is the right partner for my business that's gonna be around five years from now, 10 years from now. That's very, very hard. That's why 
the venture capital industry exists. It's a very, very difficult industry to be successful in. Uh, you know, we mentioned earlier that some, some of these real estate players have amazing, a lot of capital, you know, and they've built up a huge uh, war chest. Um, who are some of the players that are investing with you? Some of the big guys who are like, hey, we need to do this. This is important. We're not going to do it in-house. These guys seem like a right fit for us. Let us invest with them. You know, who are, who are some of those players that are investing with you guys? I'll actually give an example of the, you know, the CEO of a, of a REIT who inspired me and Fifth Wall to build our climate fund. It was Victor Coleman of Hudson Pacific Properties. Um, he had always really been at the vanguard of sustainability and decarbonization. And I think part of the reason that Hudson Pacific was like that is that they lease a lot of their space to these large tech tenants. So they probably saw it earlier than landlords only here in New York would have seen it. Mm -hmm. And he said, look, we're evaluating all of these new technologies, battery companies, solar businesses, microgrids, and we need help because we want to adopt these technologies and we want help identifying which are the right solutions for our business because we know if we're gonna make this CapEx investment, we want it to be the right company we're partnered with. So we had a working relationship with them. They were invested in our prop tech fund and they became the anchor investor in our climate fund. And then what was interesting is all these other REITs that had worked with Fifth Wall for a long time, whether it was Kimco or equity office properties or host hotels, mm -hmm. they all started to invest for the exact same reason, which is they didn't just care about prop tech software, they cared about hardware and building systems technology and this imperative to decarbonize. And they saw that they're really two different mandates. Because if you think about prop tech, PropTech is basically software colliding with the real estate industry, mm -hmm. meaning you can apply technology and do the business of real estate better, faster, cheaper with tech, right? That's the promise of PropTech. Climate tech is different because it's not just software, it's atoms. You're not just talking about companies that make lines of code and bits. These are actually physical batteries that are going into basements or solar installations on roofs that have huge CapEx costs. So the consequences of picking the wrong company to partner with or the right company to partner with are enormous. And so I think real estate owners have a, almost a more acute lens on how important it is to partner with the right businesses. And that's so, so what So who are some of the big does. real estate guys that invest with you guys? Across does, does all of related, Does RF Related does. Um, RFR? RFR does not, um, but you know, equity office properties, uh, sorry, equity, um, um, uh, Equity Residential is mm -hmm. uh, one of our, they've been an investor since the beginning of mm -hmm. Fifth Wall. Uh, Host Hotels has been with us since the very beginning. Lennar in the home building space. Uh, Kimco in the uh, strip center space. Macerich in the retail space. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's, there's 110, so right. it's, it's kind of hard to go through all out, of out them. Out of the 110, what, who do you th which one do you think is going to yield the greatest uh, for Fifth Wall? Oh, that's hard. I mean, because they're, they're also what, different. What type, what type of uh, tech do you think will yield the most? Um, I would say it's, it's hard to answer that specifically with, with respect to one owner. I can answer that more with respect to sector. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we saw a lot of activity at the outset in the home building sector because there was a lot of, in some ways, low-hanging fruit, meaning the process of buying a home is so rife with inefficiency that there was all these you know, new fintech companies, whether it was Opendoor, Blend, or Hippo, or Domo, all these companies that we actively invested in that made the process of buying a home easier, faster, cheaper, more frictionless for the home buyer. I think the next promise and the next big opportunity is around how do you make buildings smarter, right? Which is kind of this buzzword, smart buildings, yeah. right? And we're like the second pitch of the first inning into yeah. that, right? Uh -huh. I'm just looking around this building. It's a great building, but I'm guessing there's not a lot of smart technology inside this building. And so a lot of CapEx and a lot of investment is about to go into smart building technology. And I think office will be at the forefront of that, especially with the return to office and the post COVID environment, because owners are looking for a way to differentiate themselves, right? I think the, the complexity of now, what does the office mean uh, for workforces, for companies, as everyone's grappling with this, real estate owners that lean into it, I think have an opportunity to say, well, we can offer a differentiated experience. We can offer differentiated space beyond just having a great location. Mm -hmm. And tech is in some ways an unlock there for those owners. Right. And then, um, you know, I'm curious, you know, we were talking about it earlier. <laughs> There's probably a lot of asbestos in this building. 
and it would cost the building a good fortune to clean out all the asbestos. But people would rather just say, let's put some drywall on it and not find asbestos. Let's just block it out. And that's the general attitude. If the people can save costs and not have to deal with what needs to be dealt with, they rather do that. They rather leave it for the next generation or the next tenant or whatever. But how do you get people to be so motivated where they're like, we have to make this change ourselves. We have to remove all the asbestos or make this building the smartest building we can. How do you motivate people who are co you know, cost conscious to, to you know, adopt this kind of technology? It's a great question. I'm not sure I can answer it perfectly. I think that you know, what we've done around climate is probably a good example. Because as I mentioned, before Fifth Wall's Climate Fund, the entire real estate industry put $96 million into climate tech. Our fund, our first fund, 5X that, right? With $500 million. And a lot of that capital came from real estate owners that had never before invested into climate tech. So to diagnose like, well, what was the motivating factor for that? I think it was the three things I mentioned earlier. I think it was capital markets. They understand that the capital markets dynamics of major allocators of debt and equity capital to the real estate industry care about the energy efficiency of real estate assets. And they care about it not just from an optic standpoint, they care about it practically. It seems like a big part of the bet is on the capital markets. Absolutely, absolutely. Like real estate owners that have more energy efficient assets are going to have a lower cost of capital. That's an absolute certainty. Now, is that, is that reality manifested itself you know, truly today? No, it hasn't. It's beginning to. But I think smart real estate owners, large real estate owners are trying to stay ahead of that. So capital markets is a major driver. Obviously regulation, carbon fines and carbon taxes, and actually you now there's you know, grades on buildings. I didn't look at this building's grade when I walked C. in. C, okay. Right, that, that's probably not Pass. a huge problem for, for this owner right now. Right. Um, or they, this, is a, this is a condo structure, yeah. so it's yeah. a series of owners. It's probably not a huge problem from a resale perspective, but it will be. Absolutely, 10 years from now, that will impair your ability to resell a unit inside this building. And the last is, as I mentioned, tenants. Obviously, this is a unique circumstance because the owners own their individual floors, but in most cases, you're leasing space. And if Google is leasing space from your neighbor who has a more energy efficient asset versus you know, your building that might have a better location, but hasn't made the CapEx and retrofitting investment to adhere to Google's standards, it's a lot of lost revenue. So these market dynamics are just starting to articulate themselves, but I don't think you have to look much further than our fund itself to see that the real estate industry is doing something. I mean, half a billion dollars flowing into the, the, the tech to help decarbonize the real estate industry in such a short period of time, I mean, there's a lot more coming. Right. So, it has started, but you're right. It's the very beginning of a, I think, a super cycle of retrofitting and climate tech adoption and investment that is all gonna focus on the real estate industry. For the real estate firms that have their own prop tech arm like Cushman and Lenar, why should they invest with you guys, you know, as well as have their own arms? Like how, how, what's the thinking there? I mean, well, they do, Yeah, I, I guess, is, right. is, one, uh, is one thing. I think they view it as a compliment to what they're doing. You know, uh, Cushman, Lenar, they're fantastic investors in their own right, but there's only so much that they can see. And so I think they view Fifth Wall as a compliment to what they're already doing. Because, you know, having such a large pool of capital across Fifth Wall funds and having such a huge network of, you know, strategic owner, operator, developers that are investing with us, they can learn a lot. Because there's a certain pattern recognition that comes from looking at how every office owner in California, in New York, in London, in Tokyo, is looking at smart building technology or tenant engagement technology. It's almost like because of our consortium, we have certain intellectual economies of scale. There's like synergies in being a part of that because the owner of a building can talk to their peers and say, hey, how did you solve this problem? You know, Fifth Wall <coughs> invested in XYZ company. What was the pilot experience like for you? Right. So there's the benefit of learning from your peers that we can offer that you don't get just by investing entirely on your own. Right. And right, you guys do this 24 seven. That's not what they do. Yeah, but but we, we, we want them to be successful in, in their investments as well. And so we're sharing deal flow, we're co-investing together. So it actually has become quite cooperative. I think Fifth Wall is not a complete solution for you know, every real estate owner. It's in some ways an adjunct to everything they're already doing. We don't replace a sustainability initiative or you know, a team to integrate technology. We kind of, in some ways, enhance it because we give them 
a lens, an aperture on everything that's happening in the tech ecosystem mm -hmm. and market intelligence they couldn't otherwise get. What is this uh, Biden thing that he just recently announced? What was the Biden? Uh, there was a lot of money there for climate tech. Be more specific. It was just it was just recent. The IRA. What, was, what the IRA? Climate emergency declaration. No, there was some. There was a huge thing that he passed. I'll come back to it. Um, so you know, there's been more VC money going to. Uh, prop tech than any other industry for the last four or five years, I think. Um, there's been a lot of technology that comes out, not all of it's ready. What, what's some of the tech that you're seeing that's not going to last you know, three, four, five years from now? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, I guess it, it said differently, what am I bearish on? Yeah. What, what, are, what are the technologies I'm, I'm very bearish on? Um, I'll give one example, and I'm not going to talk about any particular company. I'm going to talk about a theme. Yeah. There's a, a huge promise that you can start to automate everything inside a building, right? That like everything's gonna be automated inside a building and lights are gonna turn on to exactly the hue that you want when you walk into a room and everything's gonna be personalized. But while I appreciate that, I also kind of am forced to reflect on the fact that there's not enough smart technology inside the building just to understand what's happening inside of it, let alone automate it, meaning like, Automation and analytics is the final frontier once everything inside a building is already smart. Mm -hmm. And so right now we have buildings that are by and large dumb, right? They're, they're not very aware of what's happening inside them. And so there's an enormous wave of investment that's gonna have to flow into making buildings smart, making them sensorially aware of like how tenants are moving about them, which conference rooms are being used. You know, Do we need to run five elevator shafts on Fridays in the summer? Those kind of insights just need smart technology. Mm. But truly automating a building, right? And, and having it run programmatically and layering in personalization. But that's the tenants. smart home that you were talking about. That's, right? the, that's truly the promise of okay, smart right. homes. But we first need the requisite hardware in the home to capture that, right? Let's first worry about having you know, smart lights yeah. before we worry about having truly personalized spaces inside a building. So, so you have a home in uh, Venice uh, Beach in California, in uh, Park City in Utah, and you have, now you have a home in New York, welcome. Um, what's some of the tech that you use in your home? Uh, Don't say Nest. Like something, I do have a, I do say, have a Nest. I know you have to, but like what's, <laughs> something more advanced than that. Um, I, you know, I have Savant, like, which, I, which I really like. It's mm -hmm. kind of a, a, a great smart home technology. Um, you know, if, if I had a multifamily building, I'd probably be more likely to use smart rent, which kind of lends itself more towards the multifamily format. Um, but I think, you know, th there's no particular hardware, piece of hardware that's like a silver bullet. I think what's hard for real estate owners, um, and I think you kind of saw this, honestly, in the smart rent versus latch dynamic, is that getting the hardware right is really hard, really, really hard, because you deal with CapEx cycles and functional obsolescence cycles and payback periods, but knowing that you're gonna need a lot of smart devices inside a multifamily building, for example, or an office building, that's obvious, that's inevitable. Today, about 1% of all multifamily buildings in the United States, all multifamily units in the US, have any smart device in them. Mm -hmm. So the fact that there's gonna be an enormous amount of hardware going in, that's obvious. So what I think is kind of missing is like that, um, almost like that operating system layer where you can be hardware agnostic. You can look at a smart lock company or a smart lighting company or a smart shades company or your access control system with all different OEMs and manufacturers and integrate it all into a centralized dashboard for a property manager, right? That's, I think, the first step of technology that real estate owners are looking at right now because hardware in and of itself is not a complete solution. What you're truly deploying hardware to do is to make a space smarter to in turn derive insights. But if you have all different hardware manufacturers deployed at the asset level, it's very hard to reconcile five different dashboards and make that coherent or useful in any kind of way. That's what I think is a big opportunity for like these operating systems, in some ways like a smart rent, to you know, find adoption in, in the commercial industry. Mm -hmm. I was at this uh, conference, it was all for CEOs and principals. And uh, you know, somebody, uh, this woman asked, uh, the, how many people here uh, know what ESG means? Like, and those are terms that you feel like everybody should know because you see them in headlines all the time. 
And I think there was like only like a fraction of the people who raised their hands. And these right. are all CEOs of companies, right? right. Uh, you know, you, we, you talk a lot about decarbonizing buildings and I feel like a lot of people maybe don't understand that. Like in short form, what does it mean to decarbonize a building? What it means to decarbonize a building, it means to reduce the, the carbon footprint, the impact from a CO2 perspective of what it takes to build that building, the embodied carbon, and operate that building, the operational carbon, take that all to zero. Mm -hmm. That's what it means to decarbonize but How do you do that? How do you take it down to zero? It takes energy to build things and to manage and operate things. Lots and lots of new technology. <laughs> uh, you, it sounds like you just met with the CEO of Brimstone, right? Right. That if you looked at today at cement, cement is I think 7% of the world's CO2 emissions, oh, just wow. cement. Wow. So if you looked at cement as a country, I think after the US and China, it would be the third largest CO2 emitter. Right. So that's a huge part of the problem, right? You need cement to build stuff. Certainly you needed to build buildings. And so if that's a huge, if that's a material that you're using a lot of, it, it behooves you to find a carbon neutral or carbon negative solution for it. However, you have to invest in that technology, meaning Brimstone is going to need a lot of investment to become more commercially viable and more deployed across well, the world. I remember he brought this uh, little piece of uh, cement with him and he was like, uh, you know, he was like, this cost $50 million to make or something. Right. And he was like, we had to, uh, you know, uh, get a factory to produce this. And all the money went into producing this one thing so we could raise, you know, a couple hundred million dollars more. And so I thought that was very interesting. But the fact that, you know, there was that much capital ready to say, yes, produce me this much cement that's like, you know, carbon free. As a proof of concept. Right. And, and it's because it's, you know, it's the most used material on earth. Mm -hmm. And for that exact reason, we should all be investing technology and right, investing capital into the technology to achieve carbon neutral or less carbon intensive cement mm -hmm. because it's just so impactful. So the real estate industry has kind of dealt this hand. Like it can, it can ignore it. It can kind of be kind of grumble about it, but it's here. The real estate industry is now like front and center in the climate debate. And the other challenge the real estate industry faces is that unlike other industries where if you don't like the local regulation, you can move where you, where you produce, mm -hmm. right? You can't move a building. So if the owner of a building in Midtown Manhattan doesn't like local law 97, tough luck. Right. You can't move the building to Texas to avoid the laws, right? So capital can very easily move, but buildings are stuck where they are. So there's a kind of poetic justice in that, in the mm -hmm. sense that the real estate industry is very subject to local regulation. And for that exact reason, it's very subject to regionally specific climate risks. I mean, you look at South Florida, like yeah. how much real estate is exposed to climate change? An enormous amount. Mm -hmm. It's literally billions and billions of dollars. So the real estate industry has dealt this card. I think there's, there's something kind of daunting about that, I think, for owners that they're kind of grappling with right now and maybe why they're not reading the articles mm -hmm. in, in the real deal on this. But there's also something inspiring in seeing what some real estate owners are doing, which is they're leaning in and they're saying, we need to deploy capital towards this problem. We need to help solve it. And we can't solve it individually. We have to solve it as an industry. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exciting. Yeah, there's uh, and how is this uh, like this, this sort of the whole climate tech and prop tech to reduce carbon and all this stuff? How is that received in? third world countries like India and uh, countries that don't generally care about this stuff. Like I feel like if you go to China and you tell a factory owner, hey, you need to implement this, it's gonna cost you extra million dollars, they're gonna tell you no, like we're not interested in that. I feel like the level of interest for that kind of change is not there for those countries where it is for this country. And, I think that's right. And yeah. I think that you're seeing that impact, not just from the real estate owners, but the real estate owners are kind of in some ways a product of their capital markets environment, their local regulatory envir environment, and their tenant environment. And I just don't think you're seeing it from tenants, from local regulators, and from capital markets in those geographies. Mm -hmm. Here in the US and in Western Europe, you absolutely are. I mean, Western Europe is you know, ahead of the US in many regards. Like they've been investing in tech, into tech to decarbonize their assets for much longer than the US has. It's more recent here in the US but I think it's a problem that we're gonna confront everywhere. The reality that you know, real estate is usually the largest industry in every developed economy, and the fact that it has this outsized CO2 footprint, that's here to stay. There's no, there's no getting around that issue. Mm -hmm. And the, the unlock there is enormous amounts of capital need to flow into the tech to decarbonize it. That's, that's structural. The advantage, I think, is that 
you know, in the U.S., a lot of the technology that we're investing in are U.S.-based companies. And so you have U.S.-based companies and U.S.-based technologies that can be adopted by U.S. landlords. So that is an advantage, but I think it'll cascade to the whole world eventually. And where do you think there's the opportunity for you guys, not for you guys, but just for prop tech, uh, where, you know, obviously uh, commercial space, commercial office space is going to be reduced. Every company is reducing their footprint in terms of commercial office space. Where do you think... Uh, climate tech or prop tech can be applied to, to the reduced you know, footprint of all this commercial office space. I mean, if you take Manhattan alone, that's 500 million square feet of office space, right? So let's say we come back to 80%. That still leaves 100 million square feet of office space that's going to be, that's going to be left empty. And you know, buildings are like living organisms. You leave them abandoned long enough and they'll start to deteriorate and deteriorate the things that are next to them and so on. So where's the opportunity for prop tech to sort of fill that void or help that 20% or maybe it's going to be even larger than 20%? I don't think that tech is an answer to you know, that challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, at the most essential level, the, the most energy inefficient thing we can do is build the wrong stuff, right? Mm -hmm. So like the, the ghost cities in, in China, that is the most energy efficient thing that humans can do is build cities that no one occupies. Uh, and the same is true of real estate assets. Um, I don't think that's a tech challenge or a tech uh, solution right, that, that yeah. is going to be offered. I think that's in some ways, a, it's almost like a sociology and demography problem for mm -hmm. real estate owners to solve. I mean, mall owners have been dealing with this for a while, right? I feel like the, the stat that the US has too many regional malls is a stat that I've heard since we started Fifth Wall and what to do with those malls and how to convert them into potential residential or convert them into there's so many different use cases right. that have been proposed. I don't think that's a tech uh, there's not a tech solution. There's no silver bullet there from tech that will solve that. I think real estate owners need to go back to what is the proper value of land. Because if you think about what real estate is at the most essential level, it's humans using space to create the economy and mm -hmm. create civilization. And so real estate owners, especially in, you know, because they've become so uh, asset class and sector specific, they haven't had to be sociologists in a long time. But I think the question of like, what do you do with 20% of US off or New York office space that would otherwise lie vacant? That's a sociology problem, right? And it touches on issues of, you know, public ethics that I think real estate owners are going to have to grapple with. Um, and I think tech can be a contributing factor to that. But I don't think it's the sole answer. What do you think that could, what do you think uh, something that could happen where it would make uh, climate tech front and center for everybody tomorrow? It's a great question. Um, what could happen that would make climate tech front and center? Remember tomorrow? when Sandy happened, you know, all of a sudden we had all this design come up about how to build walls around the city it put all of the electronics and utilities on top of the building. Like immediately people came up with solutions of like, how are we going to fix this? Right. Right. And then, you know, it was 10 years ago and now people sort of forgot about it and, you know, onwards, but like what would happen where people are like, we have to figure this thing out. We got to do these changes immediately, you know, to, to be able to operate. I mean, these catastrophic climate events, right. And the, the, the damage they can do to real estate value in the U S and globally, you could kind of use that as an answer, but I don't think that's a great answer because it's too indirect, mm -hmm. meaning it's very, hard, it's very hard to draw a causal relationship directly between the real estate industry's failure to decarbonize and Sandy flooding assets, right? It is there. There is definitely a relationship, but it's not as direct. Um, I think it's going to be something more tenant driven, um, meaning a very large tenant is simply going to say, these are my new standards. And if you don't conform to these standards, I won't lease space from you. Mm -hmm. And I don't think real estate owners have internalized some of the pledges that have already been made. I'll just give an example. Amazon, right, has very publicly committed to being carbon zero by 2040. Mm -hmm. But when they commit to being carbon zero, they're in turn committing their entire supply chain to being carbon zero, mm -hmm. which includes their scope three emissions. And most people don't reflexively think of the real estate industry as a supplier to Amazon, but it is in the form of warehouses and intermodal facilities and offices and data centers and now retail stores. And so as Amazon is forced and compelled to decarbonize based on its own standards, it's going to be looking much more acutely at the spaces it leases because it's going to be responsible for those emissions in turn. 
So I think it's going to be largely private markets driven by large tenants that are saying we're only going to lease space from owners that conform to our increasing criteria of what we'll accept from an energy efficiency standpoint. I feel like that's such a slow process. It is. You know, because like you're waiting for ten these leases are 20, 30 years and you're waiting for tenants to be like morally inclined to be, you know, net zero. Uh, you know, carbon net zero, but uh, I feel like that's a really slow process. It's a slow process, but you're already seeing it. I think it's unsurprising that, you know, when 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 I look back on like why did we create our climate fund, that the original inspiration came from one of the largest owners of office buildings on the West Coast, right, right. Hudson Pacific Properties, Victor Coleman. Like the reason he saw this sooner was I think both because he, because he cared about it, but also because he was hearing this from tenants, and I think that in New York. You're probably not hearing it as much. And I would imagine if you go to China, you're not hearing it as much as well. But that will change. So I agree with you. It's not happening at the pace that anyone necessarily would want, but it is happening. And I think that eventually it's going to be very much a dynamic of like you could have lots of real estate assets that are unleasable mm -hmm. to some of the largest tenants. And that's going to start to impair value. And that's going to make otherwise very difficult to swallow capex decisions much easier to do right because replacing your water cooler replacing your hvac system is going to make a lot more sense if that in turn makes your asset leasable to a tenant it wouldn't otherwise be able to lease to do you feel like policy changes are happening at the pace they should be happening no no i mean you're definitely seeing a lot to be optimistic about and i think you know under the trump administration he probably was probably the most regressive from an environmental perspective administration in recent memory. Obviously, the U.S. pulled out of the Paris Agreement. Biden put the U.S. right back in it. I think that was his first act, act actually, as president. But even under Trump, one of the things you saw was that at a local level, a lot of cities made their own basically Paris equivalent laws. So Local Law 97 contemplates fines for real estate owners that don't adhere to certain criteria. Now, those don't go into effect until you know, much later, meaning I, to some extent we should all be rooting for them to go into effect sooner because they'll create the incentives for real estate owners to invest in decarbonization, but they don't. But I think that you're dealing with a dynamic of most real estate globally is concentrated in cities. Most cities are more progressive than rural areas. That's just a dynamic and you can't move a building. So unfortunately for real estate owners from their perspective, the, the valuable assets in the world are in the most progressive jurisdictions, which are most likely to enact the most aggressive carbon neutrality laws and carbon fines versus rural areas. And that's a reality that's only increasing over time. And finally, is uh, climate tech and prop tech, is it, uh, is it a good business financially? I think it's a great business. Has it been um, good to you? It has been, yeah. I and mean, I, I know you guys raised, you've raised a lot of money, but has it, has it had real returns for you guys? Absolutely. And I think... You know, can you share some of those numbers? I can't, unfortunately. Um, what I can say is that... So we're going to take your word for it. You got to take my word All for right. it, I guess. Um, <laughs> what I would say is it, 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 it's one of those opportunities that just seems so staggeringly large. And it always surprised me. But back when we started Fifth Wall in 2017, it was just so striking to me that there was no prop tech focused funds of, of size. Because real estate is 13% of US GDP. It mm -hmm. is the largest industry in the United States and is one of the lowest spenders on IT. Mm -hmm. The average US industry spends about 3% of industry revenue on IT. Mm -hmm. The real estate industry spends about one half of 1% of industry revenue on IT. Oh, wow. I think over time, that will collapse. As it does, you're talking about hundreds of billions of dollars being spent on information technology for the real estate industry. Mm -hmm. It's almost inevitable, right, that enormous amounts of value are going to be created. And right. so, I think what we all just lived through in the last five years was the first, the first you know, cycle of that boom, but it's a super cycle that's gonna take a very long time. We just talked about this building, right? right? This building has a lot of tech to deploy and right. a lot of capex in front of it. And I think a lot of prop tech businesses will be beneficiaries of that. <laughs> I think in some cases it just makes sense. I mean, this building's 125 years old. So it just in some cases, it just makes sense to take the building down it might. and rebuild it. I mean, a lot of the retrofitting you're talking about, you know, uh, so many of these co uh, commercial tenants are going into newer buildings because of some of the stuff you're talking about, but just because of layout and the way it's constructed and so on. So, you know, to go into some of these older buildings on Park Avenue and say, let's retrofit it and spend tens of millions of dollars to retrofit it. In some cases, it just might make sense to be like, we're going to take it down and rebuild it the way people want it to be built now. 
I don't know if that's feasible, but uh, you know, we'll see. But uh, and that's it. Do you have any final words? No, just love the real deal. And um, are you a subscriber? I am a subscriber. You have to be a subscriber. I am a subscriber. Oh, yeah, I love good, it. The, good, the whole good. the whole team is. So yeah. um, I love I love your content. I think it's so interesting, and I love the fact that. You started to, I mean, you've always covered prop tech since yeah. we've been around. And now it feels like you're also starting to cover climate tech. And I think that's just exciting and an important conversation for real estate owners. Right. Even if they don't like reading it, they should. <laughs> right, they will. <laughs> Thank you, Brendan. Appreciate it.